Okay, start. Uh, good morning, sir. I am Dr. Smith from Burlapi Hospital, Jaipur. This is my case capsule, and I will be presenting. My patient, Pateri Devi, 49 year old female, resident of Haryana. She is homemaker by occupation, and she presented to us with the chief complaints of pain upper abdomen for the past two months, jaundice 40 days back. And fever 25 days back. History of presenting illness. Excited. The patient was apparently well two months back when she developed jaundice. <coughs> and you uh, shift to the next slide. Yeah. The patient was apparently well two months back when she developed the pain, which was in the right upper abdomen. It was diffuse, it was severe in nature, it was non radiative. There was no relation with the food intake and the pain got relieved by intravenous analgesics. And then the patient also had jaundice, which was which patient noticed yellowish discoloration of the eyes. The jaundice was progressive. It was associated with high colored urine. It was not next next slide next slide please yes. It was not associated with pruritus. The patient did not notice the color of the stool and was not associated with any prodromal symptoms. Patient underwent an endoscopic stenting procedure around 30 days back, which did not lead to the resolution of its symptoms. Then the patient developed fever around 25 days back, which was continuous, high grade, not associated with chills and rigors, and the fever subsided and jaundice also decreased after the patient underwent a tube drainage, which was done two days after the onset of fever. And that tube, as per the patient, drained yellow colored fluid which was around 50 ml for the next five days. There is no history of hematemesis, melina or hematalgesia. There is no history of any lump in the upper abdomen. There is no history of any vomiting. The history of loss of appetite is present. History of loss of weight, although it's been told by the uh, patient's uh, relatives, patient itself has not quantified the loss of weight. There is no history of any abdominal distension and no history of any neck swelling is there. The past history, the patient had multiple episodes of right upper abdominal pain in the past two years, query biliary colic. There is no history of jaundice in the past, no history of any surgeries in the past, and no comorbidities are there. Personal history, patient has normal bowel bladder habits. There is no history of any drug abuse. He, she consumes a vegetarian diet. And in the family history, there is no history of any malignancy in the family. Summarize. Shall I summarize this? Yes, yes. So she is a 49 year old female without any comorbidities who presented to us with a right upper abdominal pain and pro progressive jaundice with previous history of query bilirubin colic, status post endoscopic stenting, developed fever, which was followed by a tube drainage, which led to the resolution of its symptoms. Go back to your first slide. <laughs> yes. Okay, next. So here, if you are making an online presentation, uh, you should also add the duration again, although you have said two months, but here you should say pain for two months. Okay. And uh, may I interrupt? Uh, the first slide you have men mentioned her name is Bateri Devi. You should not mention the name of the patient in any public forum because it invades the privacy of the patient and it may be utilized against the patient in ways uh, which are difficult to imagine by us. So in the interest of privacy, you must never, you might write BD or you might write a uh, patient 49 year old female only. Okay. Yeah. No radiation. Now, uh, the other day also I said that you should specifically say you ask for radiation to wear. So whether you ask for radiation to back, whether to the shoulder, whether to the back of the right chest, so um, uh, specific, uh, even the negative history should be specific. And again, relation with food intake, whether you are asking for aggravation or relief, depending on what you are thinking. So if you are thinking of a, um, a biliary colic, you could have said uh, there is no history of aggravation with the uh, heavy fatty meal. If you are thinking of peptic ulcer disease, whether the food gets aggravated or relieved by food intake. So the negative symptoms which you mention also tell the examiner what is going on in your mind and why you ask that history. 
नेक्स्ट ओके नेक्स्ट Hmm. So you said tube drainage. It would have been better to say an external tube drainage. Yes. It, it was a percutaneous tube, no? Yes, sir. Yes. So external tube drainage. Next. No history of any lump in the upper abdomen. What? Uh, what was in your mind that you asked this? Chroma gallbladder. So say right upper abdomen. Okay. Sir. That would be more specific. And what do you mean by no history of neck swelling? Any lepidopathy? How many times have you seen a patient who comes and says that I have a neck swelling because of lymph nodal enlargement, and when they have very large obvious nodes, which is usually not the case in abdominal malignancy, that usually happens in tubercular uh, nodes. So I don't think uh, it is uh, necessary to mention no history of uh, neck swelling. Mm. Okay, next. Yeah. So, uh, go to the summary, please. Sorry, Avinash here. So, what do you think? Sir, uh, my history has both things. That is the case of obstructive jaundice. I am not able to still sure whether it is a benign or malignant. There are points which are going in favor of benign. Yes. So this is a case of obstructive jaundice. I am still not sure whether it is benign or malignant. There are points which are favoring of benign as well as in the favor of malignant also. So uh, since the patient has multiple episodes of pain in the past, the long history goes in the favor of a benign obstructive jaundice. But since the patient has a jaundice which is progressive in nature, that is more likely to happen in a malignant jaundice. Benign. Can I hear it here? Uh, Rajan, please go on. There's some problem with my audio. Uh, please carry on. This is yeah, go on, please. Mm -hmm. sure. yes, sir. Just me, go on. Okay. So, as I said, sir, uh, it is a case of obstructive jaundice. The etiology is benign or malignant. There are points which are favor in both. Uh, since there is a long history of previous episodes of biliary polyps, so that goes in the favor of a benign obstructive jaundice. But since there is a progressive jaundice with query loss of weight, so that goes in the favor of malignant obstructive jaundice. I'm still not able if to. You, if you have a jaundice in a patient with biliary stones, yes, what are the possible differential diagnoses you are entertaining? So the first uh, important thing is it could be a polydopolithiasis. Okay. Stone has slipped into the CBD or the mm -hmm. polylithiasis has complicated that and it has become a huge polycystitis. With various complications that could have caused this slight jaundice. These are the two main possibilities that I think in a patient of polylithiasis with the jaundice. What about hepatolithiasis? Yes, sir. Hepatolithiasis. What about worm disease? Yes, sir. Ascaris in our country is very frequent and ascaris can cause obstructive jaundice. Yes, from present. There is no history of uh, uh, parasites. You should always mention history of parasites. If you are working in Thailand or so, what would be the cause? Fasciola hepatica. Yeah. So you should mention all the causes. Yes, yeah, can you make your... Uh, microphone uh, close to you uh, because okay. your audio is not very good quality. Am I audible now? Yes, yeah. it's better. Okay, sir. So, I have said, sir, to summarize, it is a case of obstructive jaundice. Uh, etiology is either benign or malignant. There are points which are favorable of benign as well as in the favor of malignancy. So, just on the basis of history, I am not sure whether it is a benign lesion or a malignant lesion. You is forgot everybody else? syndrome as well. Is everybody else able to hear just me properly? Is the problem at my end or? We are able to hear properly, sir. Okay. Yeah, so uh, maybe I will make some repeat remarks because I am not able to hear uh, Jasmeet's voice very clearly. Uh, the commonest cause of obstructive jaundice still is CBD stones. Okay, so the commonest cause of jaundice is hepatitis. 
commonest cause of obstructive jaundice is cbd stone commonest cause of malignant surgical obstructive jaundice depending on where your patient comes from in north india it is gallbladder in south india it would be uh, periampullary or pancreatic cancer and as uh, dr desai was trying to tell you if you go to southeast asia then uh, it may be even hepatolithiasis and uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma related to uh, hepatolithiasis or worm infestation in the uh, biliary tract the other things are you shouldn't forget conditions like sclerosing cholangitis igg4 disease uh, which can cause obstructive jaundice without there being a stone so these uncommon conditions you have to keep at the back of your mind in case finally after clinical examination or even investigations what you are thinking as the clinical diagnosis is not proved and then you start thinking of the uncommon causes of whatever presentation is there so you have to keep them in mind and you have to know about them because they will come up during the discussion at some stage okay yes carry on the friends of the next slide okay next next, next please examination yes in general physical examination my patient is calm cooperative conscious well oriented to type place and person the bmi is 20.2 is epoch one pallor could not be assessed due to presence of icterus there is no cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy icterus is present the pulse is around 78 per minute the bp is 134 by 84 per minute the respiratory rate is around 80 and patient is ap5 there are no signs of liver pain the abdominal examination is on inspection but like this is central and inverted all quadrants are moving correspondingly with respiration there is no visible scar sinus enlarged veins peristalsis or pulsation hernia orifice no visible cuffy pulse is seen and there is a tube draining yellowish turbid fluid which is seen in the right hypochondrium on palpation that there is tenderness present in right hypochondrium on deep palpation liver is palpable just below the right postal margin spleen is not palpable cardiac sites are normal on percussion this liver dull liver dullness is felt in the fifth interpostal space and liver span is around 14 cm in the middle labicular line the flanks are tympanic normal bowel sounds are heard on dre the sphincter tone is normal no mass or blood finger is stained with yellowish fluids and the other respiratory cvs and cns examinations are closely normal what is the most important finding that you are looking for in the abdomen in a patient with surgical obstructive jaundice so the presence of any lump to the right hypochondrium sorry presence of lump mass palpable in the right hypochondrium or the gallbladder is palpable in the right hypochondrium so you did not uh, say specifically whether a lump is palpable in the right upper abdomen right hypochondrium or not you have to say it that is the one of the most important findings because that gives so much of information so in a patient with surgical obstructive jaundice how does it help if the gallbladder is palpable or it is not palpable gallbladder is palpable the level of obstruction is not to be at distal end like it's more of in a carcinoma head of pancreas you could feel a palpable gallbladder whereas if a mass is palpable it could suggest to a carcinoma gallbladder more than a head of pancreas yeah so you have to differentiate that whether the lump is because of a distended gallbladder or it is a gb mass distended gallbladder takes the shape of the gallbladder so it is piriform or oval in shape it is smooth it is soft to firm it has a side to side mobility and obviously it moves with respiration on the other hand a gb mass may not necessarily be like the shape of gallbladder it could be rounded also it is in the area of the gallbladder it is firm to hard it also moves with respiration but it will not have a side to side mobility like a distended gallbladder so distended gallbladder means that the block is at the lower end which is either periampullary carcinoma or a pancreatic head cancer it could also be because there is a block at the cystic duct the commonest cause being a stone causing a mucosal or 
a tumor at the neck of the gallbladder or a mid cbd cholangiocarcinoma which is blocking the cystic duct and again causing a mucosal on the other hand if the cause of surgical obstructive jaundice is a hilar cholangiocarcinoma then the gallbladder will not be distended also you have to keep in mind that if an endoscopic or percutaneous intervention has been done then obviously these findings are fallacious because once biliary system has been drained then the distended gallbladder because of a lower end block will disappear so if the patient tells you that i felt a lump before the endoscopy or percutaneous intervention was done but now i can't feel it that means it was a distended gallbladder because of a lower end block on the other hand a distended gallbladder because of a cystic duct block will not disappear or will not decrease in size even with biliary drainage so these are some small subtle points in history and examination which can tell you what is the cause of the distended gallbladder and whether it is a distended gallbladder or a gb mass but you have to mention that you look for a palpable gall although in this case you may argue that it is not relevant because biliary drainage has already been done but as i explained to you that in some situations the distended gallbladder will persist even after biliary drainage so in any patient with jaundice you have to mention about whether the gallbladder is palpable or not and whether it is a distended gallbladder or a gb mass so what is your diagnosis after examination Uh, still more in the favor of benign and uh, as well. I need to investigate the patient further to conclusively reach to How do you suspect Merizzi syndrome clinically? A uh, patient with symptoms of biliary colic who is presenting with a jaundice, sir, it could be one of the suspicion that might be a Merizzi syndrome. So, how do you differentiate whether it is CBD stone or Merizzi syndrome? The uh, jaundice in a CBD stone is intermittent jaundice, sir. There it will not be intermittent jaundice in a Merizzi syndrome. clinically there would virtually be no difference the clinical diagnosis would still be cbd stone birizzi syndrome is a diagnosis of investigations clinically the presentation would be like uh, cbd stones which means uh, surgical obstructive jaundice with or without cholangitis okay how will you proceed there are to the basic blood investigation after doing this I'll go with the ultrasound of the whole abdomen just to look for the pathology, the organ of origin. So interpret the investigations. The, the previous one, sorry. Yeah. What is your uh, interpretation? The the WBC count is around ten point three. The creatinine is normal. There is elevation of total bilirubin. So and the alpha cell is raised. The PDINR is normal. So. There is no from the blood investigation. There is no evidence of uh, cholangitis, sir. But there is hyperbilirubinemia, and which is uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and with a uh, raised alpha's and the sympathetic function of the liver is normal as per these investigations. Did you not do a CRP? You should have done the CRP. Yeah, either procalcitonin or CRP. Yes. Why do you need it? So to look for a long-standing infection, the sepsis underlying source of sepsis. It's also used as a follow-up tool of treatment. Once you treat, it will fall. Yes. So, so this is the ultrasound the patient got done at the peripheral center, and it is suggestive of a ill-defined heterogeneous lesion at the GP fossa, which is suggestive of a focal GP ball thickening at the neck region, which is very neoplastic. This is what they have given. So, what is your approach? Uh, going by this, sir, it looks like a. It comes. It is a malignancy of a GB neck, which is 
impinging the form which could be impinging upon the thomboric body cut and causing the septic clot okay so is this a sign of irresectability no sir not any more sir previously it was considered to be irresectable unresectable thing but with time they have given the evidence that even in the presence of obstructive clots if yeah. we go and do the uh, resection there is a survival benefit okay compared to the neck a uh, fundus gallbladder uh, gacgb how are the two different from each other Uh, see, there is less chances of obstructive jaundice in the case of a fundal CAGB, and also there is a less vascular invasion in the uh, tumor which is arising from the fundus as compared to the neck. So, resectability and survival is better in the patient who have a fundal CAGB. Okay, so treatment-wise, how would you uh, differ in these two treatments? Uh, the, the treatment of these conditions. Yes, pillory resection would uh, very often. less it could not be required in a fundal cagb sir it could most often be we would do a liver resection and in cases of neck we many a time will require a, a, a common hepatic tract resection sir followed by maybe if there is a vascular invasion we might need a what about the liver how much liver would you remove in a case of uh, neck gb so it depends upon the invasion of the liver sir and as per the various studies they say it Uh, we need to achieve a rg resection which could be achieved by either of the methods and the it won't really uh, the overall survival is not different in different type of liver resection that we do sir so we could do a either a 2 cm wedge resection or we could do a segment 4 b and 5 resection or we could do a modified right extended epitectomy okay so what uh, factors do you need before you can do an extended right epitectomy for an neck gb what conditions would need to be fulfilled to make that a therapeutic option yeah, we, we need to make sure the patient is not jaundiced the bilirubin level is less than 3 as per the japanese criteria and the other thing is we need a ct volumetry to look for the flr and the quality of flr whether it is polystatic or it is normal okay what can you do to improve the flr we can do a portal vein embolization directly or with uh, cvd drainage Uh, initially, we'll do a CVD drainage. Sir. We'll do a PTPT, and if the bilirubin levels will come down, and then we can go on with the definitive resection. Okay. What about cholecystitis? What is the importance of cholecystitis? Can it be a predisposing cause to? What are all the predisposing causes to uh, carcinoma of the biliary tree, cholangiocarcinoma in general? What are all the factors that predispose to cholangiocarcinoma? APB is one of the most anomalous pancreatic tumor junctions. Yeah. Primary sclerosing cholangiitis, the worm infestations, they all predispose to higher uh, these cholangiocarcinoma. Even the hereditary factors and the consumption of uh, alcohol is all a risk factor. Alcohol, I'm not sure it applies to CAGB, but I stand, I stand to be corrected. But uh, how does uh, what about all the parasites? You are not mentioning the parasites. The parasites of the scorpions and all those. Yeah, the nah. they can all cause cholangiocarcinoma and biliary enteric anastomosis also yes, is an important uh, predisposing factor to biliary carcinoma. So you should mention cholecystal cyst. You should mention parasites. You should mention. Uh, sclerosing cholangiitis uh, uh, you should mention anomalous pancreatico biliary ductal union and uh, in gallbladder uh, porcelain gallbladder but now the porcelain gallbladder uh, more and more evidence is emerging that diffuse transmural calcification is not uh, so much premalignant as focal intramucosal uh, calcification which is more important and uh, i don't know because in between i lost uh, a voice whether we discussed that in the lft the serum albumin was only 2 so in a benign uh, condition uh, uh, of a short duration it would be very unlikely that the patient will have such a low serum albumin so that again indicates that there is something going on for a longer uh, period of time which the patient may not have noticed 
You should also remember that albumin fall without other factors suggestive of weight loss or of fat loss uh, could be just an acute phase reaction to cholangitis. So a low albumin doesn't necessarily mean nutritional. It's not the only indicator of nutritional uh, conditions. It's also a marker of sepsis. It's a marker of malignancy. It's a marker of uh, an inflammatory condition. Okay, what next? Then after this, the patient underwent a DRDP procedure. The, the next slide. That's on the premise that the lesion is coming so, out of uh, the neck. If, if this patient came to you at that stage, yes. would you have done an ERCP? No, sir. I would first have done a CT scan, sir, to establish the receptability. No, was there an indication for ERCP? Patient was not in cholangitis. Yeah, so you should say that at that time there was no indication of uh, cholangitis because uh, of your CP or endoscopic intervention because uh, the patient did not have cholangitis. In fact, uh, she developed fever after the intervention. Okay, let's see the report. So though this ERCP report is not suggesting any higher block, sir. They are only telling that the CPD and the central IHPRD they all appeared prominent, sir. And there is B4 flow of bind scene. They have put the plastic state 10 by 10 threads. Okay, so most probably there was no indication for endoscopic intervention. Then, so suppose she had come to you, you would not do any RCP, what would you do? I would first do a CT scan sir, to assess for the resectability status, whether the region is resectable or not, then I'll proceed further. So we have the CT? So first we have this MRCP which she got done and then we have a CT. Okay, let's see. This MRCP was done after around 10, 5 days after that, uh, 10 days after getting that ERCP. The previous one. So, in these, these are the T2 fiber intense axial images of upper abdomen. On the left side, we can see the there are right uh, dilated IHPR reticles. Both the right side and left side reticles are dilated. And as we go below, there is no common union, so there is no primary confluence we are not able to make out. And we can also see a focal defect in the GP wall, which is leading to extravasation of contents in the pylorical. In this image, also we can see that the left and right reticles are dilated, but there is no primary confluence form. And in the display, we can see a CPD. Very distally, we can see a CPD which is draining into the region. There also to be Shadow there. Yes, sir. There is a soft fourth tissue. lower. In the fourth lower, just above yes. the gallbladder, yes, you can see some kind of a uh, mass lesion. So yes, that also soft is soft important. Tissue. Thickening is seen in that pyloric. Yeah. Yes, sir. This is the report. Sir. This is suggesting that focal GV fundal wall breach with adjacent subjective collection, suggestive of a contained GV perforation. And there is a single segment 8 conangular axis, and also they suggest a high biliary structure involving the primary biliary confluence and common hepatic duct with mild IHPR dilatation, very mitotic, very internal. So, what is your interpretation of this uh, MRC finding and uh, report? There is a higher structure, and I'm still not sure of the cause, whether it is because of a Surrounding inflammation caused by the GB perforation, or there is per se a primary pathology. How would GB perforation at fundus cause a stricture at the biliary ductal confluence? Maybe long standing inflammatory tissue over the there, it might lead to a surrounding inflammatory thickening. No, no, nothing like that has been described. You are making connections where you shouldn't be making connections. So that is important. So the cause. The causes of a high biliary, high biliary block which is involving the primary ductal confluence are which is the commonest cause of a high biliary block. Or a CAGB causing or you can say CAGB. You could also say Miridzi, which is causing very high 
where the uh, stone is uh, compressing the common hepatic duct but it would not it usually would not cause ductal separation it would cause a high block but the ductal confluence usually would be patent so the two common causes of uh, uh, high biliary block which is involving the ductal confluence would be hyalur cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer neck other could be a primary sclerosing cholangitis which if it is focal it is impossible to differentiate from a hyalur cholangiocarcinoma only when it is multifocal then you can say it is psc if it is a single lesion then it is virtually impossible to differentiate from a cholangiocarcinoma so this uh, whatever they have reported that there is a fundal uh, breach and uh, 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 contained perforation that cannot cause a hyalur uh, block that probably secondary to the gallbladder being obstructed at the neck and cystic duct by the tumor so you said that you would have done a ct yes sir which are the situations where in surgical obstructive jaundice you would do an mr ct rather than a ct like you got to look for the extent of the disease i would prefer to do a mr ct as compared to what was the question i asked what are the conditions or situations in surgical obstructive jaundice i didn't say malignant okay colidocolithiasis so if you are thinking of colidocolithiasis you won't do a ct you will do a mrcp if you are thinking of a colidocal cyst you will do an mrcp if as dr desai earlier pointed out that for whatever reason suppose the patient has inflammatory bowel disease also you are thinking of a primary sclerosing cholangitis you would do an mrcp so for most benign and, and um, as sudeep has pointed out that if you are uh, suspecting uh, mirizzi based on the ultrasound what are what are the features of mirizzi mirizzi as i said clinically will present as surgical obstructive jaundice with or without cholangitis you have evidence of biliary obstruction on lft you do an ultrasound you see a large stone at the neck of the gallbladder you see mid cbd obstruction and proximal dilatation so ihbrd is there confluence is formed chd is dilated but below that you don't see the lower cbd so all these findings make a very high suspicion of mirizzi although you must remember that sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate between mirizzi and gbc neck so that is where again an mrcp would be very helpful because it will show you a stone in the neck of the gallbladder with mid cbd obstruction wherever you suspect malignancy especially of the lower biliary system or pancreas most people would prefer a ct scan now as far as hyalur malignancy is concerned uh, there are two kind of schools of thought some people would still do a ct and an mrcp whereas many groups now are going for a single investigation in the form of mr imaging mr cp and mr angiography which if it is good if you are very well versed in reading mr images gives you all the information that you want because for a hyalur cholangiocarcinoma you want to know what is the circumferential spread which means whether the vessels are involved uh, proper hepatic artery and main portal vein and the longitudinal spread which decides how much of liver resection would be required in a hyalur cholangiocarcinoma so you need information for both yes. so how do you classify hyalur cholangiocarcinoma and how do you classify mirizzi syndrome the hyalur cholangiocarcinoma can be of two types it is either a papillary or a sclerosing type sir. i asked for the classification not for the types not there is a difference between type and class what you are describing are the types of cholangiocarcinoma dr desai asked you classification so by whose name this classification goes this was quadrate classification this was quadrate classification quadrate hmm. classification so tell us that describe yeah it is a there are four types it could be type 1 where the level of fracture is more than 2 cm from the uh, hyalur type 2 where it is less than 2 cm from the hyalur type 3 can are you describing benign biliary fracture Sorry. classification or classification of cholangiocarcinoma confusing uh, type 1 is 
where there is away from the uh, it is away from hyla type 2 where there is hilum is involved type 3 is further divided into a and b where the base of the there is a adequate like, base present and in type b b is where there is base is not well formed and in type 4 there is separation of uh, this is benign, benign bilirubin structure. It is not a bismuth cordlet. Okay. Bismuth cordlet is at without involving the hilum in the upper CBD. Involvement of hilum without cutoff. Involvement of secondary bilirubin ducts is type three. Yes. So the, the bismuth classification of benign biliary stricture and bismuth classification of uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, uh, it, it, some people call it hilar, some call it perihilar, is different because in uh, biliary stricture there are five types. Here you have only four types. So you need to know, appreciate that there is a difference. Okay. Yeah. So do we have a CT scan of this patient? So this is the these are the axial images of upper abdomen. And we are both the faces, the arterial and the next one is the venous face. So in this phase, we can see a biliary uh, stent which is in situ, sir, and we can see a catheter which is draining the collection side by side. Also, we can see mild IHP dilatation, and in this venous face, sir, we can notice a filling. Uh, we can see a partial thrombus in the right portal vein. Yeah, go on. Uh, in this venous phase, we can see the ISP dilatation. Still, we, there is no primary conference is being formed. And we can see a partial filling defect or a thrombus in the right portal vein. Also, in the periphery, we can see a lesion. Uh, cystic lesion with peripheral enhancement suggestive of an abscess in the segment 6 of the liver and and there is also a soft tissue thickening which is seen in the hilar region sir, which is progressing downwards to the next image there is one more yeah. <coughs> and also we can see there is a distended stomach sir. And this distension is going up to the entropyloric region with a soft tissue thickening, which is going up to the first part of the tendon. Both the stent and the PCD is visible. The figures are too small for us to appreciate uh, the changes. It might be easier for you for us. They are very very small because I am accessing it from a phone. Okay. I won't be able to make out. And bismuth uh, correlate 4 is involvement of the secondary duct. Bismuth 3 is involvement of the primary ducts. Uh, bismuth uh, correlate 2 is involvement of the hilum. And bismuth 1 is involvement of the CBD below the hilum. Okay. So you said that in the CT there is a uh, uh, access cholangiolytic abscess. Sorry. You said that there is a cholangiolytic abscess in the CT scan. Yes, sir. You are not audible. Yes, sir. Ah, you said there is a cholangiolytic abscess. Yes, sir. So, uh, can you describe how do you say that it is a cholangiolytic abscess? There are abscess which is present in the patient with a hilar, with a block in the biliary system, or it is a cholangiolar abscess. <coughs> it is seen in this the venous space that we can see in the second image. In the, there is a peripheral enhancement. What else could it be? Metastasis. So, how do you differentiate? See, whenever a question is asked, you have to also try to understand the intent of the question. Obviously, if I am asking you to describe a cholangular abscess on CT, 
I want you to describe how you can differentiate it from a uh, metastasis because both are seen as space occupying lesions. So quickly, you have to tell me what are the differences between a metastasis and a cholangular abscess. Metastasis are usually hypoenanthic, and this this shows a peripheral enhancement, which is likely suggestive of abscess as compared to a metastasis. Is that all? That's the only difference. Margins. Yeah, margins. They are well for here. Yeah, the margins are slightly irregular. <laughs> irregular, aggy margin. Whereas metastasis usually has a well-defined margin. And as rightly said, the metastasis is usually hypodense or hypoenhancing. Whereas the abscess has a enhancing rim. The center may not enhance because that is necrotic, but the rim enhances. And usually in an abscess, around the abscess cavity, there will be edema, tissue edema, which is again seen as a hypodense. So there is an enhancing rim and surrounding that there is edematous parenchyma. But it is not always possible to differentiate between a metastasis and an abscess. And other thing to begin with, you can say if the patient has recent history of cholangitis or is having cholangitis, then a space occupying lesion is more likely to be uh, abscess. Suppose you see a space occupying lesion and there is no history of cholangitis, there is no biochemical evidence also of cholangitis, then you will think more that it is uh, a metastasis. Of course, ultimately, the proof comes from FNAC. The other is that if you have a high suspicion of a cholangular abscess, you treat the patient with parenteral systemic uh, antibiotics, wait for a week or two weeks, repeat the imaging and see whether the SOL resolves. If the SOL resolves, it is unlikely to be metastasis. It was more likely that it is a cholangular abscess. So whenever you question is asked, you should give a complete answer to show or uh, to, to uh, uh, show that all you know about uh, whatever is being asked for. Okay? Okay. So, is the right duct more involved or the left duct more involved? And how is it important? Let's see the formal report. Is there anything else in the... Go back, please. I missed that. Go back to the CT. Exhale. Right, total Right, shape of the liver, is of the liver anything? Yes, sir. Shape of the liver, the yes, two lobes, is there anything? Yes, I thought there, is, uh, there was some of the hypertrophy lobe, of the... Yeah, so lobe. how do you explain that? There is a right portal being thrombus. Yes, so it is because of... Uh, it is a spontaneous hypertrophy because of the uh, thrombosis of the portal vein. So it's like a uh, disease-related portal vein embolization. The disease has caused a portal vein block and has resulted in a spontaneous hypertrophy of the left lobe. So is that useful or is that harmful? That is, sir, there are still not sure of the geology, but it could help us in the treatment. Sir. Since the right lobe is becoming a bit atrophic and left has grown hypertrophic, if we do a definitive rejection, that would be helpful for us. So, if you are planning to do a right hepatectomy or an extended right hepatectomy, it is going to be useful to you because it is on its own, naturally, spontaneously given you more volume, functional uh, liver volume, which otherwise you would aim for by doing some intervention. Isn't it? Yes. What is the difference between a right-sided resection for cholangiocarcinoma versus a left-sided resection? When would you do a left-sided resection? When the disease is going more towards the left side, secondary reticles, left sided reticles are involved, so you will normally do a left-sided resection. In a higher we usually do a right-sided resection. So what kind of an operation you would do? You would do hepatectomy with uh, cholangiocarcinoma or only cholangiocarcinoma? Pardon? What are the indications for excision of cholangiocarcinoma alone with lymphadenectomy? Really sure. If the secondary left ducts are involved, okay. 
and you have a uh, atrophy complex then you have to remove the atrophy complex or the ones where there are more branches an extended right actually is technically difficult if the quadrate low but its lower part is narrower in which case the left common duct will be shorter and the chance of involvement of the viridity and making it undissectable will be high so you have to make a decision between left sided dissections right sided dissections and central dissections which would be the most applicable point for cholangiocarcinoma the most adult which would be the most no either involvement of the ducts on the left side right side or both sides is it bismuth correlate four in which case there is involvement of the secondary duct and the difficulty when you are involving the secondary duct you by the time you get a margin you have very small biliary radicals to uh, anastomose so you should know this the other thing you need to know is are there any metastases in the resectable lobe or in the unresectable lobe all these factors are important in deciding hyla cholangiocarcinoma resections uh sudeep so has asked about acute uh, portal vein thrombus uh, progressing and patient landing up in decompensation of the liver i will request dr anand to answer that uh if the portal vein thrombus in the either right or the left if it in the right on the left duct it will uh, right on right on the left portal vein it will not uh, pro- create a uh, problem like decompensation because it is that segment which is Uh, get atrophied, so the other segment will get hypertrophied. If the patient having thrombus in the main portal vein, then there is a problem. We all know as the main portal vein thrombus is a relative indication of the spontaneous indication of the surgery in these patients. Now nowadays people are doing the portal vein resection also, but we are uh, we think we thought that the patient is not undetectable. So the single sided portal vein with the thrombus progress, it will not affect anything. If they having main portal vein thrombus and then progress to other either one, it will be we we consider undetectable. So, uh, we still we can put dot India dot com right angio carcinoma in the subject of the mail. So I'll send you a chapter which covers both C A G B and angio uh, carcinoma. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for presenting. Thank you, Rajen. Okay thank you sir. close yeah, yeah.